ating hinahanap ang wastong paglalapat ng pamumuno at pagtupad sa masa. Tayo para sa pagkakaisa, pagsulong Narito tayo para sa pagwawasto, pagdaluyong Narito tayo para ang kalat-kalat na pulo Magiging muon na buo Pagkakaisa, paglaban, pagumpay sa ating bayan Pagsada, itigang, paglaya ng sangkatauhan. Narito tayo para sa pagkakaisa, pagsulong. Narito tayo para sa masang aking Pilipino. Narito tayo para ang kalat-kalat na pulo. Magiging muong na buo Narito tayo para sa pagkakaisa Pagsulong narito tayo Para sa masang aping Pilipino Narito tayo para ang kalat-kalat na pulo Magiging muong na buo Ito ang dakilang misyon ng Pilipinong proletaryo Hi everyone and welcome to our new ND Line online series on Cultura at Sining, Arts and Culture for the People. Every Sunday at 3 p.m. Central European Time, 2 p.m. British Standard Time, and 9 p.m. Philippine Time. Today we will be discussing Comrade Mao's talks at the Yenon Forum on Literature and Art with Tito Jo. Hello Tito, how are you? Fine. Uh, I wish to convey my warmest greetings to you, Edna, and to all our uh, web participants. Um, we are starting uh, a new series, and um, uh, we welcome uh, all the participants, and uh, may they continue the series until uh, uh, its end. <coughs> So, the talks at the Yenan Forum is a speech of Mao Zedong on the relationship between work in the liter literary and artistic fields and revolutionary work in general. Since the May 4th movement, a cultural army has taken shape in China. To have a better background, I can we talk know. about the May 4th movement? Ah. What can the Philippines learn from it? Tapos na yung tanong. Tanong niya yan. Yung wala ko sa sagot ko. The May 4th movement was an anti-imperialist cultural and political movement which emerged from the student mass protest that began with 4,000 students in from various universities in in Beijing on May 4, 1919. The student masses rose up against the traitorous policy to the Chinese reactionary government that complied with the Versailles Treaty of uh, the imperialist powers and allowed Japan to rule territories in Shandong that Germany had surrendered. The militant student protest movement spread nationwide from Beijing and gained the support of the broad masses of the people. It inspired a new cultural movement, which laid stress on anti-imperialism and the adoption of science and democracy as new rallying points against the Confucian tradition, which was blamed for the weakness of uh, the reactionary government. 
It stimulated among the young Chinese intellectual, cultural and political leaders the study of revolutionary movements abroad, especially the Great October Socialist Revolution, and led to the founding of the Communist Party of China in 1921. Mao Zedong was himself uh, influenced by the May 4th movement and praised it in 1939 in the following words. The May 4th movement 20 years ago marked a new stage in China's bourgeois democratic revolution against imperialism and feudalism. The cultural reform movement which grew out of the May 4th movement was only one of the, men, of the manifestations of this revolution, with the growth and development of new social forces in that period, a powerful camp made its appearance in the bourgeois democratic revolution, a camp consisting of the working class, the student masses, and the new national bourgeoisie, in the national bourgeoisie. Around the time of the May 4th movement, hundreds of thousands of students courageously took their place in the van. In these respects, the May 4th movement went a step beyond the revolution of 1911. In his talks at Yan'an Forum on May 2, 1942, Mao further said, in our struggle for the liberation of the Chinese people, there are various fronts among which there are the fronts of the pen and of the gun, the cultural and the military fronts. To defeat the enemy, we must rely primarily on the army with guns, but this army alone is not enough. We must also have a cultural army which is absolutely indispensable for uniting our own ranks and defeating the enemy. Since the May 4th movement, such a cultural army has taken shape in China, and it has helped the Chinese revolution gradually reduce the domain of China's feudal culture and of the comprador culture, which serves the imperialist aggression and weakened their influence. The purpose of our meeting today is precisely to ensure that literature and art fit well into the whole revolutionary machine as a component part, that they operate as powerful weapons for uniting and educating the people and for attacking and destroying the enemy, and that they help the people fight the enemy with one heart and one mind. What are the problems that must be solved to achieve this objective? I think they are the problems of the class stand of the writers and artists, their attitude, their audience, their work, and their study. The May 4th movement was one of the major influences on the student activist and the Student Cultural Association of the University of the Philippines, which I co-founded in 1959. We were inspired by it to do our best in igniting a student mass movement against imperialism and feudalism in order to resume the unfinished Philippine Revolution of 1896 and raise it to the level of the new democratic revolution led by the proletariat in the era of modern imperialism and the world proletarian revolution. We understood and appreciated the May 4th movement as the signal for the advance of China from the old democratic revolution of 1911 to the new democratic revolution. At that time, we were avidly reading and studying Comrade Mao's works. As chairman of the SCAO in the period of 1959 to 61, I wrote a long article in the Philippine Collegian on the May 4th movement to praise it as a historic event worthy of emulation by the Filipino youth and nation. We consider the anti kafa demonstration of 5,000 students on March 15, 1961, a historic anti-imperialist event uh, similar to the May 4th movement. We also proclaimed our positive response to Claro Mayo Recto's call for the second propaganda movement against U.S. imperialism and the local reactionaries. The anti-imperialist and democratic protest mass actions for the national and democratic rights of the Filipino people against imperialism and feudalism developed nationwide throughout the 1960s to the first quarter storm of 1970. The key leaders of SCAO also became leaders of the Kabatang Makabayan, which was a comprehensive youth organization of students and young workers, peasants, teachers, and uh, other professionals like Anakbayan. 
and it up today. The KM was strongly linked to the trade union, peasant movement, and uh, student organizations, and was in the forefront of the legal struggles of the National Democratic Movement until Marcos proclaimed martial law in 1972. The KM was forced underground and facilitated the participation of thousands of its members to join the armed revolution. So in cultural work, there are some problems that need to be addressed. Mao talked about the class stand, as, as did you earlier. Cultural workers um, should always have the stand of the proletariat and of the masses. But how do we ensure this? What are the criteria that you have to fulfill in order to say, as an artist, you have the class stand of the proletariat and the masses? The semi-colonial and semi-feudal ruling system in the Philippines is exploitative and oppressive. It is dominated by foreign monopoly capitalism and run by the local exploiting classes of big compradors and landlords through corrupt politicians that we call bureaucrat capitalists. The most exploited classes are the workers and peasants and to some extent the middle social strata. To be socially significant and relevant, the artists and creative writers must know not only the general statements that I have made, but they must do as much social investigation as they can and interact with the people. Thus, they can find out for themselves that to be factually honest, truthful and socially just, they must side with the exploited and oppressed masses of workers and peasants against the exploiters and oppressors. And they must choose the class stand of the working class as the most productive and progressive class that stands for current social progress and for the future in a socialist society. According to Comrade Mao in his talks at the NN Forum, our stand is that of the proletariat and of the masses. For members of the Communist Party, this means keeping to the stand of the party, keeping to party spirit and party policy. The organs of the party, the cadres and earlier members of the party, can facilitate understanding of the basic principles, policies and lines that can guide the understanding of and needed action on concrete practical issues. Even as they need to work and associate with their peers in the cultural field, the artists and creative writers can take the initiative to study the best that has been written about the role of the working class as well as about their own role as cultural workers from Marxist-Leninist classics to the current proletarian revolutionary thinkers and leaders. They do not have to read an entire library within a short period of time to learn enough of the revolutionary theory and practice of the proletarian. The point is to apply the already understood concepts on the understanding of uh, social reality and, in gi and giving life to the people's struggle in artistic and literary works as organisms. Comrade Mao teaches us it is right for writers and artists to study literary and artistic creation, but the science of Marxism-Leninism must be studied by all revolutionaries, writers and artists not accepted. Writers and artists should study society, that is to say, should study the various classes in society, their mutual relations and respective conditions, their physiognomy and their psychology. Only when we grasp all this clearly can we have a literature and art that is rich in content and correct in orientation. There is also the matter of the audience. How do we ensure that our art and literature reaches the audience that we want to reach, which is the masses? How do we not limit ourselves to the petty bourgeois intellectuals? The matter of audience is indeed important. The revolutionary artists, creative writers and other cultural workers must go to and address the biggest possible audience, which consists of the workers and peasants. They can also help develop their own artistic, literary and cultural organizations and activities. Thus, a great movement of revolutionary art and culture, as well as a great body of artistic and cultural works, workers and works 
would arise and develop beyond the control of the exploiting classes. In the exploitative social system that we have in the Philippines, the artists, creative writers, and other cultural workers must create and develop their own organizations and link up with the movements of the workers, peasants, indigenous people, youth, women, and others in order to learn from the masses their economic, social, and cultural conditions and activities and try to create works that reflect their conditions, needs, and aspirations, catch their interest, and inspire them to fight for a brighter and better future. It is wrong to limit the relationship of the revolutionary artists, creative writers, and other cultural workers to the petty bourgeois intellectuals. It is worse to adopt the petty bourgeois pose of being without class or above classes and evading the reality of classes and class struggle and the question of what is just and what is unjust and what is truthful and what is dishonest in the exploitative society. It is worse when artists write creative writers and cultural workers outrightly cater to the class interests and sensibilities of the exploiting classes simply because they wish to earn the good graces of the exploiters, uh, reach a big audience and earn more money. Comrade now points out that there is a big audience for revolutionary art and literature. According to him, the caterers of all types, fighters in the army, workers in the factories and peasants in the villages all want to read books and newspapers once they become literate and those who are illiterate want to see plays and operas, look at drawings and paintings, sing songs and hear music. They are the audience of our works of literature and art. Take the caterers alone. Do not think they are few. They far outnumber the, the readers of any book published in the Kuomintang areas. The question of for whom is fundamental in creating art? Is it for the oppressor or for the oppressed? Are all artistic works political? Is it not possible to have an art that is neutral? To be revolutionary, the artists and creative writers must be resolutely for the oppressed masses against the oppressors. This is of fundamental importance. In the final analysis, any work of art has a class character and is political. It serves either the oppressor or oppressed. Even works that are created from a petty bourgeois standpoint that opposes, obscures, or obeys the just cause of the oppressed amount to work serving the oppressor and falling into line with the class interest of the oppressor. Mao points out that Marxists have long solved the problem of for whom in literature and art. He states, this problem was solved long ago by Marxists, especially by Lenin. As far back as 1905, Lenin pointed out emphatically that our literature and art should serve the millions and tens of millions of working people. For comrades engaged in literary and artistic work in the anti-Japanese base areas, it might seem that this problem is already solved and needs no further discussion. Who then are the masses of the people? The broadest sections of the people, constituting more than 90% of our total population, are the workers, peasants, soldiers, and urban petty bourgeoisie. Therefore, our literature and art are first for the workers, the class that leads the revolution. Secondly, they are for the peasants, the most numerous and most steadfast of our allies in the revolution. Thirdly, they are for the armed workers and peasants, namely the Eighth Road and New Fort armies and the other armed units of the people, which are the main forces of the Revolutionary War. Fourthly, they are for the laboring masses of the urban petty bourgeoisie and for the petty bourgeois intellectuals, both of whom are also our allies in the revolution and capable of long-term cooperation with us. These four kinds of people constitute the overwhelming majority of the Chinese nation, the broadest masses of the people. Our literature and art should be for the four kinds of people we have enumerated. To serve them, we must take the class stand of the proletariat and not that of the petty bourgeoisie. 
today. Writers who cling to an individualist, petty bourgeois stand cannot truly serve the masses of revolutionary workers, peasants, and soldiers. Their interest is mainly focused on the small number of petty bourgeois intellectuals. This is the crucial reason why some of our comrades cannot correctly solve the problem of for whom. In saying this, I'm not referring to theory. In theory or in words, no one in our ranks regards the masses of workers, peasants and soldiers as less important than the petty bourgeois intellectuals. I am referring to practice, to action. In practice and action, do they regard petty bourgeois intellectuals as more important than workers, uh, peasants and soldiers? I think they do. Therefore, Comrade now gives the following admonition. We encourage revolutionary writers and artists to be active in forming intimate contacts with the workers, peasants, and soldiers, giving them complete freedom to go among the masses and to create a genuinely revolutionary literature and art. Therefore, here among us, the problem is nearing solution, but nearing solution is not the same as a complete and thorough solution. We must study Marxism and study society, as we have been saying precisely, in order to achieve a complete and thorough solution. By Marxism, we mean living Marxism, which plays an effective role in the life and struggle of the, of the masses, not Marxism in words. With Marxism in words transformed into Marxism in real life, there will be no more sectarianism. Not only will the problem of sectarianism be solved, but many other problems as well. Mao talked about the balance of popularization and raising of standards. What, what does that mean? Can you give an example on this for us to better understand it? Comrade Mao states that since in the first place our literature and art are basically for the workers, peasants and soldiers, popularization means to popularize among the workers, peasants and soldiers and raising standards means to advance from their present level. He raises a series of questions and answers them. What should we popularize among them? We must popularize only what is needed and can be readily accepted by the workers, peasants, and soldiers themselves. Consequently, prior to the task of educating the workers, peasants, and soldiers, there is the task of learning from them. This is even more true of raising standards. There must be a basis from which to raise. Take a bucket of water, for instance. Where is it to be raised from, if not from the ground? It means raising the level of literature and art in the direction in which the workers, peasants, and soldiers are themselves advancing, in the direction in which the proletariat is advancing. Here again, the task of learning from the workers, peasants, and soldiers comes in. Only by starting from the workers, peasants, and soldiers can we have a correct understanding of popularization and of the raising of standards and find the proper relationship between the two. Mao uh, considers the relationship between popularization by pointing out first that popular works are simpler and plainer and therefore more readily accepted by the broad masses of the people today. Works of a higher quality, being more polished, are more difficult to produce and in general do not circulate so easily and quickly among the masses in the course of the People's War. He points out that the workers, peasants and soldiers are now engaged in a bitter and bloody struggle within the, with the enemy, but are illiterate and uneducated as a result of long years of rule by the feudal and bourgeois classes and therefore they are eagerly demanding enlightenment, education and works of literature and art which meet their urgent needs and which are easy to absorb in order to heighten their enthusiasm and struggle and confidence in victory, strengthen their unity and fight the enemy with one heart and one mind. He points out that the prime need is not more flowers on the brocade, but fuel in the snowy, weather and that therefore popularization is the more pressing task. And may I add, uh, um, uh, the heroes of uh, 
the works of an art literature should uh, come from the workers, peasants, and soldiers themselves. To round up, Comrade Bell concludes that through the creative labor of revolutionary writers and artists, the raw materials found in the life of the people are shaped into the ideological form of literature and art serving the masses of the people. Included here are the more advanced literature and art, as developed on the basis of elementary literature and art, and as required by those sections of the masses whose level has been raised or more repeatedly by the cadres among the masses. Also included here are elementary literature and art, which conversely are guided by more advanced literature and art and are needed primarily by the overwhelming majority of the masses at present. Whether more advanced or elementary, all of our literature and art are for the masses of the people. And in the first place, for the workers, peasants and soldiers. They are created for the workers, peasants and soldiers and are for their use. In revolutionary art, there is the political criterion and there is the artistic criterion. What is the relationship between the two? Gordon Mao declares that in the world today, all culture, all literature and art belong to definite classes and are geared to definite political lines. And that there is in fact no such thing as art for art's sake, art that stands above classes, or art that is detached from or independent of politics. He points out that proletarian literature and art are part of the whole proletarian revolutionary cause. They are, as Lenin said, cogs and wheels in the whole revolutionary machine. He stresses that party work in literature and art occupies a definite and assigned position in party revolutionary work as a whole and is subordinated to the revolutionary tasks set by the party in a given revolutionary period. He rejects any contrary arrangement that leads to dualism or pluralism and that in essence amounts to politics, Marxist, art bourgeois as preached by the muddlehead Trotsky. Comrade Bell states, we do not favor overstressing the importance of literature and art but neither do we favor underestimating their importance. Literature and art are subordinate to politics, but in their turn exert a great influence on in politics. Revolutionary literature and art are part of the whole revolutionary cause. They are cocks and wheels in it, and though in comparison with certain other and more important parts, they may be less significant and less urgent and may occupy a secondary position. Nevertheless, they are indispensable cocks and wheels in the whole machine, an indispensable part of the entire revolutionary cause. He emphasizes, literature and art, even in the broadest and most ordinary sense, we could not carry on the revolutionary movement and win victory. <coughs> Failure to recognize this is wrong. Furthermore, when we say that literature and art are subordinate to politics, we mean class politics, the politics of the masses, not the politics of a few so-called statesmen. Politics, whether revolutionary or counter-revolutionary, is a struggle of class against class, not the activity of a few individuals. The revolutionary struggle on the ideological and artistic fronts must be subordinate to the political struggle because only through politics can the needs of the class and the masses find expression in concentrated form. Revolutionary statesmen, the political specialists who know the science or art of revolutionary politics, are simply the leaders of millions upon millions of statesmen, the masses. Their task is to collect the opinions of these mass statesmen, sift and refine them, and return them to the masses who then take them and put them into practice. They are therefore not the kind of aristocratic statesmen who work behind closed doors and fancy they have a monopoly of wisdom. Comrade Mao gives guidance to United Front in the world of literature and art in the following words. Since literature and art 
are subordinate to politics. And since the fundamental problem in China's politics today is resistance to Japan, our party writers and artists must, in the first place, unite on this issue of resistance to Japan with all non-party writers and artists, ranging from party sympathizers and petty bourgeois writers and artists to all those writers and artists of the bourgeois and landlord classes who are in favor of resistance to Japan. Secondly, we should unite with them on the issue of democracy. On this issue, there is a section of anti-Japanese writers and artists who do not agree with us. So the reins of unity will unavoidably be somewhat more limited. Thirdly, we should unite with them on issues peculiar to the literary and artistic world, questions of method and style in literature and art. Here again, as we are for socialist realism and some people do not agree, the reins of unity will be narrower still. He gives further advice to the party writers and artists in United Front work with non-party colleagues. While on one issue there is unity, on another there is struggle. There is criticism. The issues are at once separate and interrelated. So that even on the very ones which give rise to unity, such as resistance to Japan, there are at the same time struggle and criticism. In a united front, all unity and no struggle, and all struggle and no unity are both wrong policies, as with the right capitulationism and tailism, or the left of exclusivism and sectarianism, practiced by some comrades in the past. This is as true in literature uh, and art as in politics. Comrade Mao weighs the relationship within the political and artistic criterion in the following words. Politics cannot be equated with art, nor can a general world outlook be equated with a method of artistic creation and criticism. We deny not only that there is an abstract and absolutely unchangeable political criterion, but also that there is an abstract and absolutely unchangeable artistic criterion. Each class in every class society has its own political and artistic criteria, but all classes in all class societies invariably put the political criterion first and the artistic criterion second. The bourgeoisie always <coughs> uh, The bourgeoisie always shuts out proletarian literature and art, however great their artistic merit. The proletariat must similarly distinguish among the literary and, artist and artworks of past ages and determine its attitude towards them only after examining their attitude uh, to the people and whether or not they had any progressive significance historically. Some works which politically are downright reactionary may have a certain artistic quality. The more reactionary they, their content and the higher their artistic quality, the more poisonous they are to the people and the more necessary it is to reject them. A common characteristic of the literature and art of all exploiting classes in their period of decline is the contradiction between their reactionary uh, political content and their artistic form. What we demand is the unity of politics and art, the unity of content and form, the unity of revolutionary political content and the highest possible perfection of artistic form. Works of art which lack artistic quality have no force, however progressive they are politically. Therefore, we oppose both the tendency to produce works of art with a wrong political viewpoint and the tendency to watch the poster and slogan style, which is correct in political viewpoint, but lacking in artistic power. On questions of literature and art, we must carry on a struggle on two fronts. In art school, works of the bourgeoisie are the ones being studied. Is it important to study the art of the bourgeoisie? Should the curriculum of art academies be changed after victory? 
It is, of course, in the nature and interest of bourgeois art and lit literary academies to admire, study, and celebrate the classical works of ancient slave and feudal societies, and of course, the great works of bourgeois artists and creative writers. The most reactionary administrations and faculty members of such academies completely shut out proletarian revolutionary works of literature and art, all that certain times some faculty members on their own initiative allowed these works to be studied and appreciated by the students. After the victory of the People's Democratic Revolution, the art and literary academies will certainly change the curriculum and favor proletarian revolutionary art and literature against bourgeois reactionary art and literature. But there can be subjects for examining and criticizing reactionary works. This can be studied by specialists, although they are not subjects for general propagation or obligatory study by all students. The critical study of bourgeois works of literature and art is important and useful, especially for specialists. We must know their positive and negative features and contrast them with revolutionary democratic and proletarian works. Remember that science and technology, the proletariat and machine large-scale production have passed through capitalist society. Anyway, especially in the digital age, there is no way of shutting out completely works from the past and from the class enemy. We must know the history of art and literature in the Philippines and other countries. Otherwise, the artists, creative writers, and the public will become ignorant of the contents of museums and the significance of artistic works and structures that continue to stand in public places. We must know the continuity and discontinuities in the cultural heritage of our nation and the world. Otherwise, we would not know how to measure and evaluate the revolutionary advances that we have made. But always, the main point is to learn from the past and others in order to serve the needs of the people and the present. Comrade Bell states, we must take over all the fine things in our literary and artistic heritage, critically assimilate whatever is beneficial, and use them as examples when we create works out of the literary and artistic raw materials in the life of the people, of our time and place. It makes a difference whether or not we have such examples. The difference between crudeness and refinement, between roughness and polish, between a low and a high level, and between slower and faster work. Therefore, we must on no account reject the legacies of the ancients and the foreigners, or refuse to learn from them, even though they are the works of the feudal or bourgeois classes. His caveat and positive guidance are as follows. But taking over legacies and using them as examples must never replace our own creative work. Nothing can do that. Uncritical transplantation or copying from the ancients and the foreigners is the most sterile and harmful dogmatism in literature and art. China's revolutionary writers and artists, writers and artists of promise, must go among the masses. They must, for a long period of time, unreservedly and wholeheartedly go among the masses of workers, peasants and soldiers, go into the heat of the struggle, go to the only source, the broadest and richest source, in order to observe, experience, study and analyze all the different kinds of people, all the classes, all the masses, all the vivid patterns of life and struggle, all the raw materials of literature and art, only then can they proceed to creative work. Otherwise, you will have nothing to work with and you will be nothing but a phony writer or artist, the kind that Lu Xun in his will so earnestly cautioned his son never to become. Art and literature or cultural work in general are part of organizational tasks. Would a revolutionary organization be effective without it? How important is it in organizing? Art and literature or cultural work in general is a necessary and decisive part of the revolutionary machinery and task. 
Without it, a revolutionary organization or the entire movement would be ineffective. Cultural work facilitates in the most persuasive and pleasing way um, uh, to gain the people's understanding um, of the moral justness, the principles, policies, and line of the revolutionary movement. It hastens the arousal, organization, and mobilization of the masses and inspires them to act as a revolutionary force against their oppressors and exploiters. It would be a dull and ineffective revolutionary movement that has no culture. Cultural work raises the fighting spirit of the people and sharpens all weapons of the revolution. Without cultural work, the revolutionary movement would be sluggish and would even fail. Even before being able to seize political power with the use of the people's army, the proletariat must be able to create and develop the cultural part of the superstructure of the socialist future during the people's democratic revolution. Otherwise, the cultural dominance of the, ex of the exploiting classes would persist and hamper or even reverse the advance of socialism. Should artists then be organized? Some artists express that their art is being restricted by organization. How do we deal with such sentiments? How do we balance organizational tasks and the freedom of art? I have already pointed out earlier in accordance with the teachings of Lenin and Mao, it is absolutely necessary for the artists, creative writers and other cultural workers to be organized. Otherwise, as isolated individuals, they are ineffective elements against oppression and exploitation, and they remain more subject and more vulnerable to attack or manipulation by the forces, agents and mechanisms of imperialism and the local exploiting classes. Petty bourgeois subjectivists and opportunists preach that the artists, creative writers, and other cultural workers must be against being organized in order to be free. But in fact, they thus become captive to the ruling system and the exploiting classes. In the just revolutionary struggle of the Filipino people, every creative writer, artist, or cultural worker interested in the common struggle against oppression and exploitation needs to be organized and encouraged to contribute to the unity and strengthening of the revolutionary movement. When they are organized, they learn from each other collectively, draw strength from each other and from their unity and collective capabilities, and they can fight more effectively against the unjust ruling system and the forces of class oppression and exploitation. And yet they can still create and develop their works individually and in necessary work collectives and draw inspiration from their multi-talented uh, colleagues in their organization and from the entire revolutionary movement. It is necessary to build the organizations of party writers, artists and cultural workers under the guidance of Marxism, Leninism, Maoism and the leadership of the Revolutionary Party of the Proletariat. And it is also necessary to build United Front organizations which the party elements and non-party elements can join. The waging and advancement of the People's Democratic Revolution in the Philippines requires the broad United Front of the patriotic and progressive creative writers, artists, and other cultural workers. Maybe you can share some personal experiences, how art and culture influenced your political activism, if it did. I'm very much influenced by revolutionary art and culture in the development of my political activism. While I was in the university as an undergraduate and graduate student, I practically gobbled up all creative writing that was available in the main library of the University of the Philippines. And that had something to do with the Philippine Revolution, with the left movement in the US during the 1930s, and the classic literary works from the Russian, Chinese, and other revolutions. I had the advantage of being a student in English and journalism, and then a graduate student in comparative literature. 
But I was also intensely interested in literature with revolutionary content. I also found it enlightening, invigorating, and fulfilling to be with cultural and political activists in Scow, with writers in the Philippine Collegian and the UP Writers Club. In my time, these became centers of discussions, mass communications, and militancy along the line of the National Democratic Movement. I also acted, acted in place together with uh, Ben Cervantes, Lino Broca, and Ismael Bernal, uh, who became great uh, filmmakers. So we came to be friends in the UP Dramatic Guild. It is in the theater that you learn to work with others, rehearse and coordinate with many others, and blend with various artistic talents in order to come out with a creditable total product in a series of stage presentations. I have written poems, essays, and other works with revolutionary content to this day. I wrote short stories and two novels and put them away because of my own judgment that they were not good enough politically and artistically. I taught English literature and encouraged my students to study revolutionary literature, even when this was not part of the syllabus. I also taught, as a social science subject, Rizal's novels, uh, No Lime Tangere and El Filibusterismo. I dealt with these as expose of the oppressiveness and exploitativeness of Spanish colonialism, with continuing relevance to the semi-colonial and semi-feudal ruling system in the Philippines uh, today. Maraming salamat, Tito, um, for these for answering our questions. We will be having a short cultural break of two songs, um, but we are now opening the floor for questions from the audience. Um, feel free to send in questions through message or in the comments. Um, for this break, the first song um, is a, uh, the first song is a song called "Ang Sarap Umibig" by Tony Palis. Tony Pali spent much of 2017 collaborating with us at Musica Publico for the Songs for Peace project. This was an initiative of musicians initially sparked by the war in Marawi, eventually carrying the theme of just and lasting peace. His composition and contribution to the collection was this song he wrote in 2011 and which he arranged for the vocals of Janine Santos, and recorded here for the Songs for Peace project. The second song is Kung Lili Motman Ang Mundo, composed by William Manzano and Janine Santos and performed by Janine Santos for the Songs for Peace project. It was recorded in Musica Publico's outdoor recording sessions and released in 2017. May we find peace and solace in music in times when we've forgotten what humanity means. Sintay sa digmaan pinanday Hindi ma 
talks at the Yenan Forum on Literature and Art um, discussion with Tito Jo. Um, the floor is still open for questions from the audience. Um, just write a comment or send us a message. Um, and meanwhile, I will start with the first question. Do you think the process of creating art in itself is dominantly individualistic opposed to collective? Do you think we should also revolutionize this individual process of creating art? Yes, it's true that uh, uh, predominantly uh, the process of uh, creating art is done by the individual uh, artist or writer. Um, uh, such an artist or writer would have to take into account uh, so many things beyond himself, no? like uh, mastering the subject matter by uh, knowing social reality, uh, going to the masses, and then, of course, uh, with regard to the purpose of uh, serve, uh, uh, heavy, uh, serving uh, what kind of audience that involves uh, uh, so many people. But the, the process of creation in most cases uh, in uh, artistic and uh, literary work would mean having someone byline the work and it is usually that's that's the result of uh, the work being done concentratedly by the individual artist or writer and uh, I think that's not something strange because even in science uh, discoveries are made uh, um, laws scientific laws are established and uh, they are usually ascribed to an individual scientist uh, uh, but there are certain cases when a certain scientific uh, uh, law is discovered by a group of scientists and the group all the group members uh, are mentioned uh, they it's not only one guy who receives the Nobel Peace Prize but several sometimes but in most cases uh, single scientists uh, um, take the credit uh, and they must have done most or all the work in the, in a concentrated way. That's also true in uh, political work. Uh, you cannot have so many presidents all at the same time, no? <laughs> or the, so many uh, prime ministers or so many... Um, and and uh, uh, every... Uh, in the, in the uh, revolutionary movement, there are what you call the cares. Uh, leaders who are capable of leading, but uh, they are of different uh, scales and levels uh, of uh, leadership. So that's also true in uh, artistic and literary creation. But there are certain there are certain uh, artistic works that require collectivity. For instance, well, a play may be ascribed to a certain playwright. He wrote the play. Okay. Uh, but you cannot uh, stage the play without a collectivity of uh, actors and uh, uh, having uh, artists uh, uh, preparing the sets. And uh, to coordinate everything, you have a, a theater director, a director, usually. It's also in music. You cannot play an orchestra. You cannot have an orchestra or symphony performing, let's say, the, the work of a particular musician like Chopin on Beethoven, you know, you cannot, uh, you have to have, and then, but there is an individual with, who is specially mentioned, it's usually the conductor, no? the conductor has a mastery of the, uh, of the uh, uh, whole uh, orchestra. That's also in the case in, uh, in choral arrangements, no, um, and uh, of course in the, uh, uh, um, in executing a play, uh, you have the stage director. Eh? Uh, so uh, there is, uh, um, I think we have established already that in most cases, uh, creation is, um, is an, uh, it involves uh, the individual artist or writer um, executing uh, the, the work of art. No? And then, um, uh, just like cooking, you have to have a cheap cook, you know, or a single cook, if you cannot afford so many cooks. 
And then, uh, <laughs> uh, but there are certain cases where a collectivity, a group at the least, uh, uh, works together, and then you have a massive uh, a collection of people uh, playing uh, assigned parts in a whole orchestration in the uh, in the orchestra. Now, um, uh, I think uh, that's clear, no? Um, how important is the individual, but it's also important that, that such an individual artist or uh, creative writer, if he's of any significance to the revolutionary movement, he must learn from the masses and must uh, deliver his product uh, to the masses and the masses must accept the work if it is, uh, if it is, if it is any good at all. Salamat. Um, so the second question, um, do you think it is important to have a separate organization of artists as artists, or should they just be integrated in organizations of peasants, workers, etc.? Yeah, I believe that uh, there are several possible organizations which uh, artists and writers must join. Uh, let us, uh, depending on the condition, on the situation. At first, uh, you can have a, an organization of cultural workers and you can put there together the, uh, the, write, the creative writers, the artists and uh, cultural workers who, uh, 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 who are in the performance, in the, uh, who are in the performing arts, no? You can mix them, no? And yet that would be something distinct from other political organizations, um, there's still uh, some amount of a specialization there, although of a certain broadness among cultural workers. But if there are so many, if there are so many painters, they might group themselves as a, they may form their uh, organization of painters or creative writers usually. Creative writers um, in, in the university usually put up their writers club, no? Uh, so they they distinguish themselves from the other cultural workers, and also well groups of singers. Um, they um, uh, they have their own um, uh, performing group, and they have also their uh, uh, social formation. they uh, uh, well uh, if they are revolutionaries, they can form a group of uh, of us revolutionary singers. So uh, the um, the, 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 let's say, the, the scale, the scale of uh, specialization um, can be manifested in the form of an organization depending on the number, the number of, uh, um, the number of possible members. For instance, uh, <laughs> you can form an organization of, uh, uh, um, uh, of, uh, uh, artists using musical instruments, no? Now, they may have, they may be using different kinds of musical instruments, but if you have so many violinists, why not an organization like, or at least a group of violinists? So, there is no, there is no limit to the formation uh, of uh, groups or organizations to which artists and literary uh, uh, men, uh, people of uh, writing creative uh, uh, works. Um, there is no limit. Um, uh, but then, of course, you have to have some. We have to have some sense of practicality. I think it's always good to uh, um, to form uh, first uh, a, a, a a broad cultural formation where you can have a mix of people if you're just starting. But when there are so many people uh, belonging to a certain category of, uh, of uh, creative writers or uh, uh, artists, you can uh, make uh, further, further uh, specialized groupings. So the important thing is to belong to an organization where um, there, there is a political line uh, of serving the masses and uh, serving the revolution. Uh, that is the important thing. And then uh, it all depends on how many people you have. It is inevitable that, uh, let us say, um, 
uh, you know, uh, there may be a comprehensive youth organization like Anakbayan, and you know, the cultural group uh, can grow out of that, uh, uh, can, or can be spun off by that uh, comprehensive organization. And then uh, there may be right away a specialization. Um, for instance, uh, there may be um, an organization of creative writers, different from, let's say, the, the groups of uh, performing artists. Uh, I think uh, Pandai Sining is predominantly um, an organization of performing artists, uh, musical and uh, uh, stage uh, presentations. The, um, so, uh, that's it. The, the important thing, as I had, I had pointed out in my presentation, in, my, in one of my uh, answers to, uh, in my answer to one of the major questions, um, the important thing is that the individual uh, cultural worker, uh, artist or creative writer must belong to a collectivity because he can draw more strength and he can be more effective that way than become a, a, an isolated individual. Um, so uh, I, I think it's clear that there are uh, advantages in being in a collective, especially if, if you are involved in advancing uh, the, the revolution, the Philippine revolution. Uh, it is something in, uh, necessarily collective. It's a, it's a movement of arousing, organizing and mobilizing uh, great masses of the people in order to advance and win victory. What does Chairman Mao mean when he said, let a hundred flowers blossom and a hundred schools of thought contend? Well, uh, Mao said that uh, 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 all the masses and all the organizations must uh, bring out their creativity in order to advance the revolution. Uh, of course, there are the reactionaries who interpret this as, you know, as, you know uh, expressing all sorts of ideas, especially reactionary ideas. Also, some, some people in uh, China, inside China, would even uh, really take advantage of that uh, statement as, uh, as giving leeway to what is uh, rightist and uh, reactionary. So there were the rightists in the late 19. Um, 50s. But uh, what Mao, um, you know, uh, the uh, revolutionary movement at any point in time, or uh, if you were in a socialist revolution, as in China when Mao uh, made that statement, you know, there is uh, a practically a limitless uh, latitude for uh, the creativity of uh, thinkers as well as uh, uh, artists and writers in um, bringing out their, uh, their works. Uh, so it is not an advocacy of uh, ideas that run counter to the socialist, uh, socialist cause, but rather it is letting, uh, letting um, all revolutionary uh, ideas and works uh, uh, blossom and uh, flower uh, in, a, in the socialist society. So that's also the case because, uh, um, you know, uh, if there is no uh, spirit to create more and more, uh, then, you know, the revolutionary movement becomes, uh, as I said, uh, can become sluggish and boring. Uh, especially in the field of art and literature. That's the way how to make the revolution um, uh, lively yeah, and vital. Yeah. You know, some people think that uh, uh, in the revolutionary movement, you always have to be grim and determined. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, the revolutionary process is a very happy thing, you know. Uh, 
it's um, there is joy in hitting the head of the enemy. <laughs> there, is, there, is, there is joy in fighting the enemy. Of course, some sacrifices occur, but then you, you celebrate the martyrdom of people and the heroism of people, no? Um, because uh, and then when you win victory, certainly you're happy. You must have the the you have, must have the artistic and literary works to celebrate uh, such victories, definitely. And even sacrifices and martyrdom are, are uh, worthy of uh, of being um, commemorated and celebrated by works of art and literature. So that's how important uh, art and literature is in the uh, in the revolutionary process. Salamat again. Um, and the next question from the audience is. The Philippines is quite diverse culturally. Will that be a challenge in creating a united cultural movement? Um, well, the, the diversity, cultural diversities in the, Philipp in the Philippines, uh, from region to region, and you know, diversity between you know the the so-called. Um, uh, Filipinized uh, uh, in the sense of being Hispanicized, Christianized, and Westernized. You know, the indigenous people uh, in in uh, uh, in comparison uh, offer uh, many interesting cultural things that uh, that are part of the national cultural heritage. So. Um, there is uh, so there is diversity, and uh, that makes art uh, brilliant with uh, uh, shine. Uh, there is the the cultural tapestry is rich by so many uh, uh, so many parts, and uh, they come into harmony uh, with uh, um, with the national. And democratic spirit harmonizing them, and then further raising them to the higher level of uh, the socialist art, then under the guidance of Marxism-Leninism, uh, life would be life would be, uh, shall we say, uh, untenable. Life would be so sad without the diversity. But certainly, um, there is always the need to harmonize and uh, uh, unite things that are diverse. No? If the objective is to move in one direction and um, uh, make one level of progress to another. So diversity is, a, is what you might call, uh, uh, is something that spells, uh, diversity is something that uh, spells richness rather than confusion. No? Uh, there is confusion if you don't respect uh, uh, the integrity of every part that is uh, in, uh, that is uh, different from others. Uh, but there is such a thing as harmonizing, coordinating, and uniting things that are different for a higher purpose. So um, uh, the National Democratic Line. Uh, harmonizes so many different kinds of people and including different kinds of culture in the Philippines. And uh, Marxism, Leninism also is another instrument for uh, 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 harmonizing people and raising them up uh, from uh, the stage of the, uh, the bourgeois democratic revolution to the socialist uh, revolution. So um, diversity is a happy thing. It's a, it provides the raw, at least the raw material uh, for uh, the great opus, for the great work no? uh, in art or literature. And our next question, what form can a cultural movement for the Filipino struggle take here in Europe? Well, I think uh, the Filipinos should know their environment. Uh, but I think uh, um, as Filipinos, they have dedicated, they dedicate themselves mainly to the Philippine struggle. I think that uh, as Filipinos, they draw inspiration 
from the history and circumstances of the Filipino people. And uh, there, have, there are cultural movements. There is already a, a national democratic cultural movement. And that was what I explained since uh, the anti kafa uh, demonstration of uh, 1961. There was a uh, uh, cultural movement similar to that of the May 4th movement arising. And um, uh, you will notice that from uh, that time on, well, you know, Scout was just a small group of students. They may be the most brilliant and the most creative, but they relatively, it was a small group, but it was, they made the spark huh? that made the anti kafa demonstration. And this produced so many, so many activists in various fields. Um, and uh, this uh, resulted in a practically in a cultural movement. Uh, we declared that we were developing a, uh, we were making a, a revolution in the cultural field along the line of the national democratic movement, and we were calling for this for for uh, uh, the second propaganda movement. That was uh, a slogan that we got from Recto. But we had our own idea of uh, the cultural movement. And uh, I think um, uh, we have developed practically a new culture in the Philippines. Uh, and uh, it, this was, this prospered, especially in the 1960s, and went beyond 1916. And beyond, uh, beyond, I think, it went beyond the 1960s. 1970 was again yeah, a big, uh, a big uh, outburst and a big upsurge raising the level of uh, 5,000 of 1961 to uh, uh, 150 to 200,000 uh, students and other people every time that uh, there was a demonstration during the first quarter storm. And so, you know, and then, you know, the level of uh, actions uh, attended by cultural work, no? Uh, you know, you cannot have a demonstration in the Philippines without cultural work attending it. Um, you, you have the murals, you have the per, you have the, uh, per, the the performances, the street theater, and so on and so forth. Um, so, um, and then of course uh, uh, the uh, uh, culture that is of a national, scientific, and uh, uh, mass character that has always been propagated. So we have a, a, a practically cultural revolution going on in the Philippines. And this uh, should motivate the Filipinos in Europe. And uh, of course, as they are in Europe, uh, uh, they have to uh, present this cultural movement based in the Philippines uh, in seeking solidarity. You have to have your own character in, um, in seeking solidarity and cooperation with uh, the host peoples in the countries where you are. Um, how can we maximize social media to popularize the revolutionary works? I think uh, the social media are wide open uh, for popularizing revolutionary works. Um, I think it has been quite free uh, for some time. Of course, you know, <laughs> you, uh, the uh, uh, Facebook, for instance, seems to have done a good thing by cracking down on uh, uh, government on, on uh, uh, troll armies generated by a government, that of Duterte. Uh, I hope that uh, the crackdown does not extend to the left, uh, uh, to the anti-imperialist uh, de and democratic organizations. Uh, uh, I hope that the uh, uh, the abuse um, uh, of a reactionary government, the, its abuse on social media should not be put at par with the freedom necessary uh, for 
uh, anti-imperialist and democratic forces. But in the meantime, I think uh, uh, as the social media, particularly Facebook stands, you can use it as a medium for popularizing uh, literary and art artistic works that are um, anti-imperialist uh, and even socialist, no? So, uh, I think uh, this is something extreme in my long life. Uh, it is something really out outstandingly uh, effective. Uh, it's a... Uh, uh, it's a technological leap, and at the same time, it gives way to a political leap. Uh, uh, you know, higher technology is uh, sometimes the instrument uh, that can be used first by the, by the exploiting classes, but they cannot help. Uh, the exploiting classes uh, cannot help making money. You know? So, um, and then eventually people get to use uh, the in their instruments against the exploiting classes, no? So, uh, you get the point, uh, uh, the, you know, uh, in the time of Lenin, the, train, uh, the trains were uh, uh, built and expanded, no? Uh, well, they were good for uh, uh, not only moving people, but for um, business, no? But uh, the same trains can carry the revolutionary propaganda and the information and propaganda that came from the revolutionary. So, um, any kind of instrument that can uh, be used for reaching the masses, that's good uh, for to avail of. It's good to avail, uh, avail, avail of. Uh, you know, uh, the revolutionary message on any uh, event or issue spread so fast, no? in seconds. That's how, that's how um, I think uh, that strengthens my belief that uh, progress, even revolution, uh, revolutionary progress, would uh, make uh, big leaps, uh, unlike in, in the past, no? when you did not have uh, this digital means. No? Um, when this digital means combined with the worsening crisis of the ruling system, then uh, the, uh, the, the revolutionary forces become dominant and uh, they uh, determine the, the, the progress of uh, events. So, definitely, social media are an important instrument, an effective one, uh, in uh, popularizing uh, revolutionary uh, uh, artistic and literary works. Salamat. Um, and our next question, also from the audience, how shall the state wither away? And my Marxist understanding is upon socialist establishment as if it does so obediently. And I would add, how can the rep cultural movement help in the withering away of the state? Well, I think uh, the main thing to consider with regard to the withering state is uh, the question of uh, the necessity of the state and the circumstances that make them necessary. Um, in a, uh, uh, it has been made clear uh, as correct to have socialism in one country eh? in opposition to the view of uh, the motherhead Trotsky that you cannot uh, establish socialism in one country. But uh, is it possible to have communism in one country while, in, while imperialism uh, exists? And in the international bourgeoisie keeps on trying to uh, to go uh, any seed of the bourgeoisie, uh, be it the old, uh, uh, any, any any element of the bourgeoisie in a socialist society, be it uh, an element from the old bourgeoisie or um, a, an offshoot of uh, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the petty bourgeois sentiments that may arise among the educated. Um, in, in socialist society. So, um, 
uh, it is the existence, continuing existence of imperialism that would make it necessary for a socialist state to mine its own defenses, to have its own, uh, to have the state power of the proletariat to remain intact. And it cannot uh, uh, let down its guard. So, uh, in that case, you cannot uh, have the state withering, but certainly cultural work, uh, be it in the form of education, um, uh, uh, to increase scientific knowledge or uh, to um, uh, enlighten and entertain people. Certainly, they, they help in, uh, uh, in spreading socialist democracy in, uh, and then uh, also those in the state eh, um, become more civilized in relation to the increased civilization of the, uh, of the masses. In other words, you know, uh, cultural, uh, cultural work uh, uh, is supposed to bring out the finest uh, thoughts and sentiments of the people, you see, uh, for the proletariat and for the communist future. But um, so long as the imperialists continue to exist, you cannot uh, dissolve, you cannot let the state wither. Um, so uh, this is where there is a need for the proletariat um, to uh, to tilt the balance on a global scale. Um, if a monopoly capitalism, the holdouts of cap a monopoly capitalism would become so small, huh, then probably disappearance of the state, of the, the proletarian state or the dictatorship of the proletariat will, will, uh, will happen. But they, of course, the uh, surest thing, surest condition for the, uh, this withering away of the state is that, first of all, within socialist society, no more class oppression exploitation, okay? Uh, the only thing remaining is to be on guard against the um, class enemy outside. And then you have to be on guard against, you know, degenerates who take revisionism. Uh, so that involves ideological and cultural work, no? Um, but the surest the condition for uh, withering the state is when imperialism is already uh, is already finished uh, in the entire world. Uh, when it makes no more sense for capitalism to exist anywhere in the world. And uh, of course that means uh, uh, having more socialist countries first and then making having uh, most countries in the world socialist. Uh, and uh, the the surest condition is for all countries to become socialist in the world proletarian revolution. So I, I hope the, uh, I hope the, uh, I make clear uh, uh, how, in reality, the withering of the state can be affected. Uh, consider the internal factors of a socialist society and. Um, uh, the external threats that still exist yeah, from uh, monopoly capitalism abroad. You know. The MDs say that education is a cultural work and propaganda is a way to popularize the revolutionary works. Thus, in essence, activists are cultural activists. How can we as activists then be effective in our work as educators, cultural activists, and propagandists. Okay. Well, uh, the important thing is um, uh, as educators and cultural activists, uh, we can be effective in our work if we, if the content eh, of our, uh, the content that we are propagating is really uh, of service to the people. We make sure that uh, they, uh, that uh, what we propagate uh, would advance the revolution and uh, uh, result in the um, uh, social upliftment of the people. And um, 
So uh, uh, workers uh, uh, will follow the socialist line because uh, they become the ruling class and then uh, they emancipate. Uh, they, their mission is to build socialism and to emancipate uh, uh, the rest of the exploited people. So uh, that means content. But you have to mind the style, no? The style. Uh, the uh, the teacher in the in the in the school will have to um, will will have to not only you know have a good outline and syllabus, uh, 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 a good lecture uh, plan, but he, he has uh, a good style in delivering the lecture. Okay, that's also the case among uh, writers, uh, creative writers and artists. It's not enough to have the correct line. You have to express, eh? you have to express uh, in, a, um, in an interesting way, uh, in some lively way uh, uh, that catches the interest of, uh, of, your, of your audience. Uh, you know, it, it's uh, possible to, uh, you can work, uh, you can work so hard, but you know, if you bully your workmates, eh, uh, you turn them off, and even the people around you are turned off by bullying. Eh, you might say you stand for the for the uh, for the leading class, the working, uh, the proletariat, the leading class, and you represent its party, etc. But uh, if you don't have the good style. You will be the turn off. You will work against your against your class stand. No, so um, in uh, cultural work, style is very important in any in any kind of endeavor. Anyway, uh, even in uh, political uh, in outright political work, no? um, you ca you cannot just say you cannot just say dogmatically uh, and dictate in a commandist way what is the line. You have to express the line in uh, in a uh, in a proper way, and um, it is it, it, in a way that is acceptable to the people. Um, and in art and literature, uh, you have the leeway uh, to provide the images, the actions uh, on the page or in the stage. Uh, uh, um, what makes your line believable? And interesting eh, to the audience. So that's uh, there's a distinction there. It's not enough to have the correct idea. It's necessary to express the idea uh, uh, in an interesting way. <clears throat> Thank you. And our next question. How does the digital age contribute to advance the revolutionary art and culture in the current Philippine revolution with a socialist perspective? How does the digital age, uh, how can it be used to uh, cultural revolution? I don't know. Man, the digital age, as I pointed out earlier, is, you know, hastens the spread of the revolutionary message. As a matter of fact, you know, it was, it's quite surprising to me why, you know, uh, technology that used to be kept uh, secure and huh? secret, no? Uh, technology that, you, that were used by the U.S. military, say, starting from the 50s to uh, onwards, you know? Uh, would be commercialized, no? In the time of uh, uh, in the time of uh, Clinton in the 1990s, you know, uh, you know, these uh, uh, cell phones and so on, uh, they um, uh, they can be instruments for uh, let's say criminal groups to act uh, effectively uh, against you know the limited. Uh, defenses of the ruling of, of the of the police and military system and um, and yet uh, uh, these things were commercialized made available to the public the you know capitalism 
had become so desperate that it must come out with new products in order to expand. And uh, so they were commercialized. And then, you know, I refer first to the, you know, the ability of the uh, criminals to use these uh, instruments, you know. Uh, they can coordinate, they can communicate and coordinate easily. Uh, that is to, to stress a certain point. When someone uses a certain efficient instrument, you know, um, and other people have the same instrument, then they can be easily uh, thwarted. Uh, rep reported to the authorities by the people who have the same equipment. No? So, but anyway, in the, uh, as regards to revolutionaries who fight the ruling system, this uh, digital means of communications um, can, uh, uh, can make effective uh, not only propaganda, uh, uh, popularizing cultural works, and even, you know, uh, making effective tactical offensives in the battlefield, no? Um, so, if the, if the original purpose, the original purpose of the, um, the original purpose of the monopoly capitalist class that commercialized this, this sort of thing, uh, because it is necessary to expand, uh, uh, to, to, to make profits, more profits, um, uh, you know, uh, they lose sight of the fact that so when the crisis of the capitalist system anyway worsens, then the people uh, uh, could use the same means to fight the uh, system. Um, I usually make this contrast. In the time of Lenin, when he was in exile, he had to rely on the speed of the train, no? He had to rely, uh, you know, uh, there were no digital means. There was some. There, there was telephone and and so on. But you know, with this digital means, uh, you know, I've gone through uh, several stages in the development of communications. Um, first, there was a telephone, and then, then the telefax came. And uh, in in a matter of two hours, you can reach any point in the world with uh, with the fax machine. But now, in in seconds. Huh? You can spread the word with this digital means. So you can imagine uh, in the combination of crisis and people's resistance, uh, with this use of this uh, digital means, uh, you can spread the revolutionary word. Um, uh, so um, I'm, I'm sure that uh, uh, under the present conditions, while neoliberalism now is unraveling, and uh, again, the... Uh, uh, bourgeoisie, the big bourgeoisie, and uh, other reactionary classes are again resorting to the most uh, ultra, uh, the most extreme reactionary um, uh, uh, methods and the most reactionary ideas like uh, fascism, uh, uh, chauvinism, uh, misog uh, misogyny, and so on. Uh, well, they, you know. They, they try to cover up the class roots of the, the crisis. But you see, uh, the crisis has, uh, has become so bad that uh, it amplifies, it, can um, it, uh, it amplifies and makes credible what the revolutionary movement says. So um, the revolutionary movement using digital means um, is in a position to uh, to arouse, organize, and mobilize more people there in a faster way and in a wider way than before. So, um, and this is happening after a period when the uh, uh, first uh, major socialist countries uh, uh, degenerated and became um, um, capitalist. And uh, from 1991, the U.S. was uh, number one, a sole superpower. Uh, from 19, 1990, uh, 1991 to about 2008, no? Um, uh, but anyway, the U.S., uh, by its own foolishness, it, is, uh, uh, it has accelerated its strategic decline by uh, being unable to... Uh, 
uh, to overcome the uh, recurrent and more frequent uh, uh, and worsening uh, <coughs> crisis of overproduction and its uh, wars of aggression. So uh, we have come to the point that once more, the anti-imperialist and democratic struggles all over the world <coughs> are, uh, are uh, surging forward. And the once more the world proletarian, the resurgence of the world uh, proletarian revolution or socialism is again um, is again the very uh, very uh, discernible. It's something you can uh, easily foresee because of the crisis of the world capitalist system and the rise of people's resistance all over the world. So uh, it's just right that the, the people, the proletariat and the people have the digital means for communicating uh, on the widest scale possible in the fastest way. Thank you. And <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so we still have time for a few questions in case anyone um, still has some. Um, our next one is the enemy's reactions to the youth's graffiti protest art in Europe were very intense. Do you think vandalism is okay in the name of revolutionary art? Well, the class enemies describes the revolutionary art as vandalism, but I think it's okay. It's, uh, it's the right thing to do to insist that it is revolutionary art and most importantly, uh, in, most important of all, it is art that um, uh, serves the people. It calls on the people to resist uh, and to denounce the, the crimes of the class enemy. And so, of course, uh, it is uh, in the nature uh, and purpose of the class enemy to use, uh, to use uh, words that uh, depreciate, that... Uh, uh, even criminalize uh, uh, works of art, no? So I think the, there's no way but to keep on doing this revolutionary art on the walls and in all, in even the, the airspace, eh? this <laughs> of, uh, of uh, the, the, the capitalist countries. Uh, every space must be, must be used uh, by the revolutionaries to express uh, the revolutionary message. And um, it is but natural for the class enemy to fight, uh, to, 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 let's say, to resist, also fight uh, to, to uh, counteract this. And uh, it's good. If, if, you, if the enemy, if your enemy uh, reacts uh, uh, so strongly, that means you, are, you must be effective. You know? It is a test of your effectiveness. <laughs> if the enemy ignores what you do, ah, you're not doing well in fighting him. Uh, he reminds you only if you are fighting well. <laughs> Maraming salamat. <clears throat> uh, so we will close the floor now for the questions. <clears throat> we would like to thank you very much, Tito Jo, for answering our questions and for um, your insights. <clears throat> we will take this to heart um, and continue our uh, our cultural um, work and yes um, so to remind all of you um, we will be back next week um, on Sunday again at 3 p.m. Uh, 3 p.m. Central European time and 2 p.m. British Standard Time, 9 p.m. Philippine Time. Our, um, <clears throat> oh, that's October 11th, and our topic that day will be cultural imperialism in the Philippines. Yes, thank you again, Tito. <clears throat> and of, uh, I also want to say thank you to you, Edna, and uh, to all our uh, uh, web participants, I hope to uh, to uh, 
I hope that they would participate in the next session. Yes, please. Um, join us next week. Be an artist for the people. Tell the stories of the masses. Perform their struggle and paint their victory. Thank you. Oh